Hi guys, Dean here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Stars in Their Courses by Isaac Asimov. So this is non-fiction, it brings together a bunch of his different essays, which I will go through in a second. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, in 17 essays written in his uniquely informative and entertaining style, Isaac Asimov deals with such intriguing questions as, where did astrology come from, what validity does it have, and what makes it so popular today? Why do some stars appear redder than most? Is this what is meant by redshift? What, chemically speaking, is Earth? And what are rare Earths? How much longer can man continue his current rate of population growth? What can we do to guarantee the quality of life in the future? These are just a few of the topics covered by Dr. Asimov in this fascinating book, in which he proves himself as much a master of science as he is of science fiction. So, here we have uh, an introduction, then astronomy, we have the stars and their courses, the lopsided sun, the lunar on a roll, worlds in confusion. Physics, we have two at a time, on throwing a ball, the man who masked the earth, the lux and wall, playing the game and the distance of far. Uh, chemistry, we have the multiplying elements, bridging the gaps and the Nobel Prize that wasn't. And under sociology, we have the fateful lightning, the sin of the scientist, the power of progression and my planet is of thee. These are all written towards the end of the 60s, early 70s. So I want to read the introduction here because this kind of covers how I feel about star signs and astrology. But also Asimov is an INTJ in the Myers-Briggs personality types. Uh, if you know what that means, you'll probably see it coming across in this uh, excerpt. I saw the play Hair recently, largely because everyone told me I just had to see it. The music, the joy, the youthful verve, the delight. Adjectives were thrown at me as though they were darts and I was a dartboard. So I went. The first thing that happened was that the actors and actresses spread themselves all over the stage, the theatre fixtures and the audience, and started mooing. Aries bleated someone in a husky whisper. Leo groaned someone else. Gemini, Libra, Sagittarius came from here and there and everywhere. They were intoning the signs of the zodiac and a cold dread crept over me, for this could only mean that I was about to be immersed in a sticky sea of irrational folly. The dread was justified. There came a chant about Jupiter being in the house of Mars or something, and everyone started a dithy ram about the age of Aquarius. After that it was all downhill. Partly through natural squarehood and partly through a dogged devotion to rationality, I kept trying to make sense out of what I could hear through my shattered eardrums. I didn't manage. When people find out now that I saw hair, a look of holy ecstasy crosses their face, for they will lose their ticket to the land of with it if they don't register approval, and they say, how did you like it, wasn't it great? I nod vigorously and say, it was very, very loud. That sounds, like that sounds like approval so that I avoid any further discussion. And I do that without telling a lie. He points out as well, he says, of course, about 2000 years ago, the vernal equinox edged into Pisces, the fish, but astrologers pay no attention to the fact that all their signs are now given to the wrong months. It is the advantage of mysticism that having no logical content, it can't be damaged in any way by any further increase in nonsense, however great. So uh, he starts with the stars in their courses, which is all about astrology, he says, if anyone asks me what I think of astrology, I say something like, it's stuff and nonsense, sheerest bilge, absolute tripe, obviously. Except that there's nothing obvious about it to most people. Astrology is more popular today than ever before in history, and more people than ever make a good living out of it. I've read that there are 5,000 astrologers in the United States, and over 10 million true believers. There was a time when I could have shrugged that off and said something like, oh well, finding that one American out of 20 is gullible and unsophisticated is no great shock. But the greatest popularity explosion in astrology right now is among the college students who, one might suppose, are the well-read, the intelligent, the sophisticated, the hope of the future. And then he goes on to explain why that might be. I like this as well. I like this here. He says, someone who spouts nonsense in chemistry will be caught out at once by any high school student who knows something about chemistry. Someone who spouts nonsensical literary criticism, however, can be spotted only with difficulty. Indeed, what are the criteria for nonsense in literary criticism? Do you know? Does anyone? So he says, to put it as briefly as possible, many college students are taking up astrology in a big way because one, it is the in thing to do. Two, it gives them a delicious, if full, sense of security. And three, it gives them a passport to phony intellectualism. So I think this is interesting. He says, um, eclipses struck absolute panic in the hearts of all who watched, and understandably so. It is routine to laugh at that panic, but don't. Suppose you knew very well that your life depended on the sun, and suppose you watched the sun slowly fading before an encroaching blackness for reasons you could not explain. Would you not feel the sun was dying, and that all life would die with it? Consider that in our own sophisticated time, it is only necessary for some solemn idiot to proclaim that California will fall into the Pacific Ocean on 3pm of next Thursday, to cause a quick exodus of uncounted thousands from that state. It's very true. So I like this little start uh, to the essay, The Lunar Honor Roll. 
In my youth, my father discovered that science fiction was my favourite reading matter. Memory stirred within him and he said to me, Science fiction, going to the moon, aha. Tell me, did you maybe ever read books by Zul Verne? I left, I stared at him blankly. Who? Zul Verne, he replied. Zul Verne, he repeated. I was rather chagrined. I flattered myself that I knew the important writers of the world, together with the important and unimportant science fiction writers, and it annoyed me to be found wanting. What did he write? I asked. Science fiction, going to the moon, and so on. Oh, and he wrote a book about a man who went around the world in 80 days. Light broke with blinding brilliance. I knew the author well, but my father had never heard the name pronounced in anything but the French fashion. I said, and in the excitement my stately Brooklyn accent became a trifle more prominent than usual, Oh sure, the author you mean is Jules Voigne. And my father said, who? There's a great quote here about a guy called Alfonso who was supposed to have said in exasperation that had God asked his advice during the days of the creation, he would have strongly recommended a simpler design for the universe. So he says here, when uh, Joshua in the Bible commanded, commanded the sun to stand still, not only would Joshua's soldiers all have fallen down and rolled for a thousand miles, but the energy of rotation would have been converted into heat and have melted the earth's crust. But he says, instead of that, I'll mention just one little thing. There are many limestone caves in the world in which many stalactites and stalagmites have been slowly and precariously forming over a, pa over a period of hundreds of thousands of years. They are quite brittle. If the earth had stopped its rotation at the time of the exodus, or if it had even slightly changed its period of rotation, every one of those stalactites and stalagmites would have been broken. They did not, they are there, intact and beautiful as you will see for yourself if you visit any limestone cave. And those stalactites and stalagmites standing there mutely are stronger evidence against Velikovsky's theory than all Velikovsky's selected lines from myths and legends can possibly counter. And uh, but he says, so he's basically he's debunking this guy's theories and he says, but let's move on. Velikovsky needs a rain of burning fire to explain certain biblical illusions. And he finds a great deal of talk about such combustive events in his myths. You and I might suppose that the experience of a volcanic eruption is terrifying enough to account for such tales and can easily be magnified to a whole sky on fire given the inevitability of poetic license. Velikovsky, however, does not believe in either poetry or metaphor. He wants a literal rain of fire and he uses Comet Venus to explain it. On page 53 he says, The tales of comets are composed mainly of carbon and hydrogen gases. Lacking oxygen, they do not burn in flight, but the inflammable gases passing through an atmosphere containing oxygen will be set on fire. And Asimov uh, points out that it takes a temperature of 4,200 degrees Celsius to make carbon a gas. S space isn't quite that hot. In fact, space is very, very cold. So I enjoy this as well. I'm gonna read you the start of the essay two at a time. Several days ago, the telephone rang and a young male voice, having ascertained that I was indeed I, said, pardon me, sir, how do you determine the center of gravity of the Earth system? The speaker was most courteous, and I recognise the fact that I have certain duties. If I'm going to act publicly as though I know everything, and if I'm going to proceed to make any living out of that pretense, the least I can do is answer simple questions when those are put to me politely. I said, the Earth is 81 times as massive as the Moon. That means if you draw a line between the centre of the Earth and the centre of the Moon, the centre of gravity is on that line at a point 81 times as far from the Moon's centre as from the Earth's centre. Oh, he said, but how far above the Earth's surface would that be? It wouldn't be, I said. It's roughly a thousand miles beneath the Earth's surface. Aha, said my young friend. I knew he was trying to catch us. A pang of dismay clutched my heart. Who was trying to catch you? My teacher, he said cheerfully. This is my homework. And he hung up. So I give fair warning. No more question answering by phone. I'm not going to be made an innocent party to cheating. But all is not lost, it set me thinking. So I like this little rant as well. Um, he says, scientists prefer to measure mass rather than weight. And so they train themselves to say more massive and less massive instead of heavier and lighter, though only with an effort and with frequent slips. And yet they haven't freed themselves utterly from pre-Newtonian thinking even now, three centuries after Newton. Picture this situation. A chemist carefully measures the mass of an object by using a delicate chemical balance and brings two pans into equilibrium as we have described. What has he done? He has measured the mass of an object. Is there any shorter way of saying that correctly? No, there isn't. The English language doesn't offer anything. You can't say he has massed the object, or massified it, or has massicated it. The only thing he can say is that he has weighed the object, and he does say it. I say it too. But to weigh an object is to determine its weight, not its mass. The unreformed English language forces us to be pre-Newtonian. Again, these little shivers of metal that weigh a gram each, or any other convenient quantity or variety of quantities, should be called standard masses if we are to indicate they are used in measuring mass. They are not, they're called weights. Again, chemists must frequently deal with the relative average masses of the atoms making up the different elements. These relative average masses are universally called atomic weights. They're not weights, they're masses. 
In short, no matter how well any scientist knows in his head the difference between mass and weight, he will never really know it in his heart as long as he uses a language in which hangover traditions are retained like the lady who saw no difference between only son and only child. And that comes from a conversation he had with a woman who was telling him all about her son. And he said, oh, is he your only son? And uh, she said, no, I have a daughter. Because in her head, son and child were synonymous. And he said to her, do you have another son? And she said, yes, I have a daughter. Because in her head, son and child were synonymous. And uh, he ends this essay, he says, how's that for the power of a simple equation? But and there is the point of the whole chapter. When someone wishes to mention this astonishing achievement of Cavendish's, what does he say? He says, Cavendish weighed the earth. Even physicists and astronomers speak of Cavendish as the man who weighed the earth. He did no such thing. He determined the mass of the earth. He massed the earth. It may be that English has no such verb, but that's the fault of the language, not of me. To me, Cavendish is the man who massed the earth and English can like it or lump it, which leaves one question. What is the weight of the earth? The answer is simple. The Earth is in free fall and, like any object in free fall, it is responding in full to the gravitational fields to which it is subject. It is not attempting to make any further response and therefore it is weightless. The weight of the Earth then is zero. I like this as well. Give it, Asimov likes to give people a good scientific telling off, you know. Uh, what good are beliefs by themselves anyway? There is a view very popular amongst amateurs in science that it is only necessary to have a theory in order to revolutionise science. In actual fact, Theories by themselves are nothing but intellectual amusement and to become more than that they must be supported by observations. Preferably by observations that not only support the theory but that quash opposing theories. Science, like other intellectual games, has its rules. Rules that have been strictly applied for nearly four centuries and the results attained are ample evidence that the rules are good ones. Those who would revolutionise science had better learn the rules. Not because that will make them respectable but because, believe me, they will never revolutionise science without them. It is odd that, though no one who has ever studied chess would dream he could beat a grandmaster, so many strict amateurs with little or no scientific training are convinced they can point out the obvious flaws in Einstein's theories. Nor can amateurs console themselves, as many often do, with the thought that they laughed at Galileo. Sure, some did, but many didn't. Galileo overthrew Aristotelian physics because, for one thing, he was a thoroughgoing student of that same Aristotelian physics. Similarly, Copernicus upset the Ptolemaic theory because, in part, he had a thorough education in Ptolemaic theory. And Vesalius cast out Galenic anatomy because, it must be understood, he was an expert on Galenic anatomy. This is a general rule that must be understood by revolutionaries, perhaps in all fields, but certainly in science. You must thoroughly know that which you hope to supplant. I love this little story here, uh, the start of the essay called Bridging the Gap. In 1969, Hofton Mifflin published my hundredth book. The name is Opus 100 to forestall questions, and it is by way of being a kind of literary autobiography with illustrative selections from earlier works. The Boston Globe went on to celebrate the occasion with a long article, and the New York Times followed with another article. What's more, Hofton Mifflin threw me a cocktail party on publication day. All in all, this was enough to turn anyone's head, so, lest I lose the lovable modesty which is my hallmark, I'm keeping firmly in mind something that once happened to my mother. Back in the early 1950s, my parents finally sold their candy store and moved into well-earned retirement. Naturally, time hung heavy on their hands, so my father got a part-time job that only took up 40 hours a week. The candy store had taken up 90. And my mother went to night school. My mother felt keenly her inability to write English. She could write Russian and Yiddish, but neither language used the Latin alphabet. She could read English, but didn't know the written script. So she took a course in writing and made marvellous progress. In no time at all, she was writing me letters in clear script. Then, one evening, she was stopped in the hall by a member of the night school faculty who proceeded to ask her what we, in our family, call that good old question. He said, pardon me, Mrs. Asimov, but are you related to Isaac Asimov by any chance? My mother at once said, yes, indeed, Isaac Asimov is my son. The teacher said, oh, then no wonder you're such a good writer. Upon which my mother, well aware of the unidirectional flow of genes, drew herself up to a full four feet ten and said, freezingly, I beg your pardon, sir, no wonder he's a good writer. Uh, as I was talking about when uh, x-rays were discovered and it says panicky members of the New Jersey legislature tried to push through a law preventing the use of x-rays in opera glasses for the sake of maidenly modesty which was about par for legislative understanding of science sounds about right and here we learn about the Nobel Prize that wasn't for uh, with Mosley uh, who I think it was him yeah he did uh, the x-ray work in 1914 the physics prize went to von Laud in 1915 to the father-son combination of the Braggs in both cases the work on x-rays had served as preliminaries to the culminating work of Mosley. In 1916 then, Mosley would have had to get it. There was no way of avoiding it. 
I'm sorry, there was a way of avoiding it. In 1914, World War One broke out and Mosley enlisted at once as a lieutenant in the Royal Engineers. That was his choice and he is to be respected for his patriotism. Still, just because an individual is patriotic and wishes to risk a life that is not entirely his own to throw away, doesn't mean that the decision makers of a government have to go along with it. In other words, Mosley might have volunteered a thousand times and yet the government had no business sending him to the front. Rutherford understood this and tried to have Mosley assigned to scientific labours, since it was obvious that he could be far more valuable to the nation and the war effort in the laboratory than in the field. By World War II, this was understood and Mosley would have been protected as a rare and valuable war resource. No such thing was to be expected in the monumental stupidity that was called World War I. In the spring of 1915, the British got the idea of landing at Gallipoli in western Turkey to seize control of the narrow straits linking the Mediterranean Black Seas. Forcing a passage through, they could open a supply route to the tottering Russian armies, which combined enormous individual bravery with equally enormous administrative ineptitude. Strategically, the concept was a good one, but tactically it was handled with incredible folly. Even in a war so consistently idiotic, the Gallipoli campaign managed just to shine as an archetype of everything that should not be done. By January 1916 it was all over. The British had thrown in half a million men and gotten nowhere. Half of them were casualties. In the course of this miserable campaign, Mosley was tapped. On June 13th, 1915, he embarked for Gallipoli. On August 10th, 1915, while he was telephoning an order, a Turkish bullet found its mark. He was shot through the head and killed at once. He had not yet reached his 28th birthday and, in my opinion, the death was the most expensive individual loss to the human race generally among all the millions who died in that war. When the time for the 1916 Nobel Prize in Physics came about, there was no award. It is easy to explain that by saying that the war was on, but there had been an award in 1915 and there was to be one in 1917. The 1917 one was to Barclay, still another man whose work was only preliminary to the great breakthrough of Mosley's. Call me sentimental, but I see no reason why the colossal stupidity of the human race should force the indefinite perpetration of a disgraceful injustice. It is not too late even now for the community of science to fill that gap and to state that the 1916 Nobel Prize in Physics, that wasn't, belongs to Mosley, and that he ought to appear in the, every list of Nobel laureates published. We don't owe it to him. I'm not that sentimental. He is beyond either debt or repayment. We owe it to the good name of science. Then we get a bit of talk about uh, Franklin investigating the lightning rod and um, basically people were like, you can't use lightning rods, it's against God's will. And Asimov says, this however was easy to counter. If the lightning were God's artillery and if it could be countered by a piece of iron, then God's powers were puny indeed and no minister dared imply that they were. Furthermore, the rain was also sent by God and if it was improper to use lightning rods, it was also improper to use umbrellas or indeed to use overcoats to ward off God's wintry winds. He says, uh, unless we're vegetarians and I am not, we can scarcely object to inventions which make meat more available. Hashtag vegan for life, yo. And we get a reference to uh, RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots by Carol Kapek. Uh, it's a play and it's the first one to introduce the term robot. And, uh, he, and then he ends by talking about overpopulation, which is something I find interesting as well. Uh, int like building on from the vegetarian thing as well, like one of them is just food. We don't have enough food to sustain everybody. If everybody went vegan overnight, the, uh, we'd have enough food to feed everybody on the planet. But that's at the moment, and <laughs> that doesn't even deal with like population growth, which is going to make things a lot worse. But anyway, he says, the island of Manhattan has an area of 22 square miles and a population of 1.75 million. In the middle of the working day, when people come to Manhattan from adjoining areas, the population jumps to 2.2 million at least, at which time the population density is 100,000 people per square mile. Suppose all the earth were covered with people as thickly as Manhattan is at lunchtime. Suppose the Sahara Desert were covered that quickly, and the Himalayan mountains, and Greenland, and Antarctica, and everywhere else. Suppose we threw planks over all the oceans and crowded those planks like a Manhattan lunch hour as well. The Earth's total surface area is 200 million square miles. If all of it were populated at Manhattan density, the world population would be 20 trillion. How long now would it take to reach that figure? As equation two would tell you, the answer is the astonishingly small one of 585 years. By AD 2554, at the present rate of increase, Earth's surface will become one huge Manhattan. And uh, he continues along that theme, so he says, Oh, well, surely by then people will be going into space. Sorry, but that's not good enough. In the next 47 years, we would have to export 3.5 billion people to the moon and Mars and wherever, just in order to stay where we are now on Earth, which at the time, by the way, was less than half the population we currently have. Is there anyone here who thinks we can do that in 47 years? Is there anyone here who thinks the moon and Mars and wherever can be engineered to support 3.5 billion people in the next 47 years, even if we could get them there? In fact, let's go further. There are about 135 billion stars in the galaxy. 
Some of them may have habitable planets in the sense that man could live on them without prohibitive engineering. Of course, we can't reach such planets, either now or in the foreseeable future, but suppose we could. Suppose we could transfer human beings instantaneously to any planet we wished to by a mere snap of the fingers and with no further expenditure of energy than that. And suppose that there was an incredible wealth of habitable planets in the galaxy. Suppose that every single star in the galaxy had 10 such planets. There would be a large number here, habitable planets in the galaxy. Suppose further that the same were true of every other galaxy and that there are 100 billion such galaxies in, in existence. Finally, what if we continue snapping fingers and transferring people until every one of those planets were populated to Manhattan density? Uh, the total population of the universe would be 2.7 trillion trillion trillion. How long would it take us to reach such a population, eh? Now that we are talking of trillions of trillions of people, it might seem that we can wait many millions of years to fill the universe in this impossible way. If you think so, you still don't understand the power of geometric progression. At the present rate of population increase, it will take us only 4,200 years to reach a population of 2.7 trillion trillion trillion. By AD 6170, we will have crammed the universe from end to end with people. Every star in every galaxy will see each of its 10 planets carrying a population that will resemble a Manhattan rush hour on every part of its surface. And he continues to figure it out and he says, um, it will take 6,700 years for us to fill literally the universe, every atom of the universe. That's how insane geometric pro uh, progression is and how badly we need to do something about our global population. And I do find this interesting, he says, think of that you conservationists and remind yourselves frequently that while human population increases, animal life must dwindle and not all your piety, wit or tears can do anything about it. If you want to fight the good fight for conservation, fight the better fight for population control. And I just want to read this a little bit that he ends on here, he says, uh, it may not happen to be sure for the exploration of the new world in the 16th century did not bring the European nations together but exacerbated their rivalry, but then they never made it a multinational project. If it does happen, however, the space effort, whatever its cost, short of planetary bankruptcy, will have been worthwhile, even if, even if it brings us nothing else. Also, if that happens, the 21st century will see mankind making the painful transition from the childhood of a pseudo-infinite world of subplanetary societies through the adolescence of a cooperative national society and into the adulthood of a planetary government ruling over a finite world. The chances for all of this are, I repeat, not large, for time is short and folly long, the need is great and vision small, the disheartening problems enormously complex and the ruling minds dishearteningly mediocre. But I must hope. We all must hope. So yeah, as you can tell, I enjoyed the stars in the, their courses, I thought it was fascinating read, I would give this a 4 out of 5 and I would definitely recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I made of the stars and their courses by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book and if you enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button for more videos. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.